Party Monsters As we said goodbye to our teens and embraced our twenties in the city, Zuzana and I made the bold choice to party like we were already well into our fifties. When we weren't closing Rose's turn or processing a bizarre show at Stingy Lulu's, we liked to sit and drink wine for long stretches of time while talking about movies or books or things happening in New York. When we ran out of those things to discuss, we would land on our favorite topic, ourselves. But even narcissism has its limits. Eventually, we would get bored with ourselves and go out into the world and act our age. We were in New York City, and if 200 cigarettes had taught us anything, it was that there were experiences to be explored and adventures to be had. We would sensibly research clubs and see where the cool people were going. We tried Tunnel. It was very crowded and very loud. Zuzana and I ended up getting locked in a cage with strangers for what seemed like an hour and were forced to dance until someone let us out. I think it was supposed to be an honor to be locked in the cage, but it didn't feel like one. Instead, it felt like, well, it felt like we were locked in a cage. Next up was Twilo. It turns out the night we went to Twilo, everyone was at Tunnel. There was the second incarnation of the limelight. It was mostly gay men, which was fun for me, but less fun for Zuzana. We ended up just walking around and shouting at each other, It's so weird, this used to be a church. The weirdest part of that was that it still looked like a church. It's like if all of a sudden Our Lady of Lords in Omaha started hosting raves after midnight mass. It was excitingly sacrilegious. We attempted to roller skate at the Roxy. Zuzana had grown up ice skating, but it turns out ice skating and roller skating require two very different skill sets. And I was rusty from the days of grade school skating parties at Skateland in Omaha. We managed not to break anything or majorly embarrass ourselves, but ultimately, we didn't last long. We went to a big, sloppy party at the Bowery Bar. It was mostly filled with young, douchey finance guys and girls who looked like they worked in advertising. A lot of Brian's and Ashley's. I accidentally put my cigarette out on a man as we were trying to make our way to the bar. After some shouting and sweaty apologizing, we figured we should probably leave the premises before we were asked to. To try something a little further afield, Zuzana took me to a hip-hop club in Harlem one night. She was very popular there. I was not, although a number of people thought I was Ryan Reynolds circa two guys, a girl, and a pizza place, so that was fun for me. And then there was the night I dragged her to the cock in the East Village. She had in town from Indiana a high school friend who had just recently come out. I thought taking him to the most aggressive gay bar in the city might be fun for him. He ended up getting his wallet stolen while getting a blowjob in the back room. But at least he got a blowjob. We would attempt these excursions a couple times a month with varying degrees of success. We would put on our clubbing looks, which were mostly mismatched all-black outfits that were either too tight or too big, would venture out to brave lines, excessively loud music, and $10 vodka sodas, which were outrageous at the time, and in my mind, still are. We'd force ourselves to dance about until finally one of us would look at the other and say, Are you ready to go? Then we would go find a pizza place or a diner and wrap up our evening with a heavy bedtime snack and one of those long conversations about life that you only seem to have in your 20s. Finding the right club for us was starting to feel a lot like dating. We just weren't meeting the right ones. We needed a new strategy. One day, Zuzana came home from school and told me about a hot new party she'd heard about. It was at a club called Mother in the Meatpacking District which at this point was not what it is today. It was certainly better than it had been in the 70s, but there wasn't a Stella McCartney store or a Dylan's candy bar yet. It was still a neighborhood that processed meat during the day and got awfully quiet at night, with the exception of prostitutes and drug dealers. It seemed dangerous, like one of the few neighborhoods in Manhattan untouched by gentrification. Once a month, Mother hosted a fetish night, and Zuzana had heard it was a lot of fun. It seemed unexpected and weird and incredibly different from our mainstream club outings. Maybe that was what was missing. Maybe we just needed a fetish night. It was there that we ran into our first problem. What was our fetish? The postcard advertising the party said, Leather, rubber, and all kinks. Did we have a kink? Could I get into rubber? We needed help planning this outing. 
A couple of years after I moved to New York, a childhood friend of mine, Randy, the one who also happened to be my prom date two years in a row, moved to New York too. When we were kids, she was the most beautiful, most talented person at the Emmy Gifford Children's Theater. She was funny and clever, and she sang with vibrato, which put her light years ahead of the rest of us. She also had an aggressive naivete about her sex appeal that was shocking to adults, but impressive to her peers. Adults at the theater used to call her Lolita behind her back. We would hear this and, not fully understanding what it meant, assume it was a compliment. Since I'd moved to New York, I'd sort of lost track of her. And then one year, she magically appeared in Manhattan, as if she had belonged there all along. She had some rather colorful jobs since I had last seen her, including lingerie model and phone sex operator. And while she was rather new to the city, I knew that she'd be able to help us figure out our kinks. Randy wisely suggested we head to the East Village and shop the stores on St. Mark's Place for inspiration. We marched into Trash and Vaudeville at St. Mark's and 2nd Avenue, ready to get our kink on. We all immediately found costumes, or just clothes, depending on how you live your life. No judgments here. But it turns out that my love for leather jumpsuits reaches its limit at 600 bucks. We had to come up with a plan that wouldn't cost us all of our savings accounts. We decided we could just find suggestive t-shirts and go from there. Fetishes were about attitude, we decided based on nothing, so we would just internalize our fetishes and live them for all to see. Susanna found a tight black shirt with a zipper cutting across the bust line that showed off her cleavage. The effect was truly obscene and exactly what she was looking for. I found an even smaller t-shirt that had the words Hooker 2000 printed across the front in bright pink letters. I figured that looking like a Twinkie rent boy would probably suffice. I also bought a pair of fashion glasses just for good measure. I guess I thought I would be a bookish Twinkie rent boy? I don't know. Randy didn't buy anything and we didn't question her. She seemed way ahead of us already as usual. The night of our big mother outing came and we all changed into our looks as we slammed glass after glass of the cheapest white wine we could find in the largest bottle possible. Thanks, Cavett Pinot Grigio and the folks at Town Wine and Spirits who never carded me. I tried to make my hair as River Phoenix-like as my Murray's pomade would allow, and Zuzana put hers in pigtails, which seemed correct. Randy just applied more eyeliner and removed her bra from under her tiny tank top. We were ready to go. We didn't trust ourselves to find Mother on foot since we weren't familiar with the meatpacking district, and we didn't want to get mugged before getting to at least dance a little. Our looks didn't seem subway appropriate, so we decided to splurge on a cab. We pulled up to Mother, and there was only a small line outside. I should mention that we never nailed timing on any of these outings. If the party started at 11 p.m., we would arrive at 11.30 p.m., thinking that a half an hour was probably enough time for things to really get going. The rest of the club would arrive at 2 a.m., usually when Zuzana and I had had enough. We never learned our lesson. The bar was sparsely populated when we entered, giving us a chance to acclimate ourselves to the environment. In other words, to keep drinking until we felt comfortable. If we were self-conscious about our looks on the street, those fears quickly went away once other patrons arrived. There were people on leashes, people with ball gags in their mouths, men in leather gimp suits, French maids, men dressed as biker cops, a man tied to a rack with a woman in stilettos standing on top of him. The scene only got crazier as the bar got more crowded. The music was fun, but no one was really dancing. It was more of a stand-around-and-look-at-people kind of vibe, which was fine by us. As time often passes in clubs like this, all of a sudden, hours had gone by, and we were now packed in the center of the room, surrounded by people who really knew what fetish night was all about. Randy nudged me and pointed to a woman dressed as Lieutenant Ohura from Star Trek. That looks like Debbie Harry, Randy said. I am, and have been a Debbie Harry and Blondie fan since I was a tiny child. After seeing them perform Rapture on Solid Gold, I asked my parents if we could buy the album. They did me one better and bought me the 8-track. The Reynolds family was never really on the cutting edge of technology. My mother still to this day owns a TV with a VHS player in it. My dad thought my undying love for Debbie Harry was hilarious. I think hoping that I had a crush on her. The reality was, I wanted to be her. Up to this point in my life, I had never seen Debbie Harry in person, and I would have gladly removed a rib to do so. I stared at Lieutenant Uhura. 
That's not her, I said. There's no way. That is definitely her, Randy replied. Between the beehive wig she was wearing, the lighting of the club, and the smoke from, well, smokers, I couldn't really be sure. I decided the only thing to do was ask. Emboldened by drink, I marched over to Lieutenant Ohura, ready to disprove Randy's theory. I got dangerously close to her face and discovered it was fucking Debbie Harry. Rapture. Call me. Velma Von Tussle. It was her. I was not prepared for this. What could I say? What could I say to this icon? I managed to string together the following sentence. Miss Harry, I love you. Auto American was the first eight-track I ever owned. She stared at me for a moment. She took in my outfit. And then she smiled and said, Thanks. I like your shirt. As she said it, she ran her hands down my chest, across the lettering of Hooker 2000. I wanted to say more. I wanted to make her love me back, but I also knew it would never get better than what had just happened. I had met an idol, she was dressed as a Star Trek character, and I was dressed as a twink hooker. I got to profess my love for her, and she said she liked my shirt while touching me. Get out, Rannells, I thought. Get out before you ruin it. With that, I said, thank you to Miss Debbie Harry, and I walked away proudly. When I got back to Randy, she said, it wasn't her, right? It was her, and she likes my shirt, was all I could say. By this point in the evening, Randy and I were drunk and losing our voices from screaming above the music as we tried to talk to people. We found Zuzana chatting up a gentleman tied to a pole with nylon ropes. We decided it was time to go. Once out of the club, we automatically headed to where most evenings ended, an all-night diner near Zuzana's and my apartment to eat various fried foods and recap our adventure. That was always the best part of any night anyway. The conversations after we got out of the noise of the clubs. We could tell hilarious stories over mozzarella sticks and tuna melts and then unabashedly talk about our goals without being self-conscious. We could make fun of each other's choices in men and then somehow share our deepest fears about failing without fear of judgment. We could just listen and cheerlead and then order more Diet Cokes and do it all over again. Looking back, I think those were the nights when Zuzana and I really forged our friendship. We might not have been club people, but we were adventurous and ambitious on our own terms, and that was okay with us. I kept that Hooker 2000 shirt for several more years, for the record. I mean, Debbie Harry touched it. I couldn't just throw it away.